and we're going to hear from uh, Matthew, who is uh, an expert. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, um, we're going to hear from Matthew on unsupervised machine learning. There'll be a lecture, and then we'll go through some problems in my Python notebook later. Uh, Matthew works here at Caltech. Um, I didn't look up his bio, so I'm going to tell you the things I remember, and then he can correct me. Um, Matthew's done a lot of work on the VO. Yes? Yes. Uh, Matthew's done a lot of work with the Catalina Real-Time Transient Survey, uh, which is run here out of Caltech. Uh, I would say that he is an expert in machine learning. I feel very comfortable saying that. And uh, you are in good hands for the next two and a half hours. So without further ado, ado I'll let Matthew start. OK. So um, my background is that I'm an astronomer. I've done a survey astronomy since I was a grad student over 20 years ago. Um, I'm now in the sense for data-driven discovery here, which means I'm actually more of a data scientist. Um, I do have a couple of co-authorships on biology papers, so I do application of some of this outside of astronomy. Um, I'm also at NOAO part-time for the last two years where I'm working on the data lab there, which is one of the environments that you may be using when you are working with LSST data in the future. Um, so it's something to talk about. Not related to machine learning at all, though. Well, it's, it's infrastructure for running this. So my main interests scientifically in astronomy are time series, um, and particularly quasar variability, um, but any sort of variability is interesting. So that that's sort of where I'm coming from. So from my perspective, unsupervised machine learning is actually one of the more interesting things because we don't really know what's there. We've got lots of data, and this is the, the way to, to sort of to, to look at it. So um, I'm going to talk for about the next 50 minutes or so on various aspects of unsupervised machine learning. And then we'll have a little break, and then we'll do the notebook similar to what we did with um, Adam this morning, sort of touching on some of this stuff, and you know, some of it may be easier, some of it may be hard. So, so I apologise if you already know a lot of this stuff, um, but um, bear with us. So, unsupervised machine learning is really, I would say, it's about um, it's inferring a function. You want to have something at the end, once you've applied machine learning algorithm, you want to have something that's useful that you can use in your further computation. So you're inferring a function over your data to try and identify hidden structure in there. You believe there's some sort of structure. Whether it's actually that you believe that your data is in clusters or whether there's some more complicated lower dimensional manifold or whatever, so you've got a you know a hundred dimensional space but actually most of your data lives on six dimensional some sort of six dimensional structure in there, that's what you're trying to get out from with unsupervised learning techniques. Um, so it's really a question of letting the data speak for itself because most of the data we're going to be dealing with in LSST is going to be unlabeled. It's uh, 37 trillion observations of 37 billion objects. That is what LSST is going to provide, and we are going to have labels for, if we're really lucky, maybe a million of those. So there's a lot of stuff that's going to be unlabeled, and this is sort of more for it. So types of activity that fall under unsupervised learning, clustering certainly, density estimation, and we're going to, those are the two we're going to cover today. Um, Autoencoding or, or deep neural networks, you'll hear more about that from um, Ashish and, and from uh, other people later on in the week, um, because they're what you're doing. If you've seen any of these really cool image things where they, you know, say, "Oh, we can now recognize faces or whatever," most of them are using this. And the way they do it is, you just put unlabeled data in, and it learns from the data the feature set that is really good for working with that data. So it's unsupervised clustering. Dimensionality reduction. We'll do a little bit about that. That's more about looking for these lower dimensional manifolds than looking for clustering. Uh, symbolic regression is a technique I'm really in favor of, and I'll mention that right at the end. But these are all sorts of things that you do with, uh, with unsupervised machine learning. So the idea is we know nothing about this, but we believe there's something in the data, and what's the best way that we can work with the data to find out what's going on there? So let's start with the really the simplest density estimation and histograms. Um, so 
why is this unsupervised? Because we believe that, that there's a, pr you know, the description we're getting out of density estimation is the probability density function for the data. So this would then allow us, if we could estimate it and plot it, you can look at the data and you go, ah, well, there are obviously, you know, there are two big lumps, two big density peaks in the density profile. And that tells us something about the data. So as, as Adam was saying this morning, the thing you always want to do when you get a new data set is plot it, visualize it, see what you can see. But your eyes are only good for certain things, and there are all sorts of weird effects that we can uh, to discover and discuss. And I think Lucianne and um, Daniela will be talking more about visualization later on in the week. Um, and so this is why we then start going to, OK, what statistics can we use to see if actually we believe what our eyes are telling us? About? You know, it looks as though there's a density enhancement there, but am I really certain that that's the case? No, I need to go and actually plot this thing. So, um, I assume we all know how to take, do histograms. Yes, right. But the big problem with histograms is how do you pick your bin size or number of bins? Okay. So this is when the machine learning sort of stuff says, okay, how can we do this? Is there an optimal way for me to maximize the amount, maximum, maximize the amount of information that the histogram is presenting me, um, so that you know I can. See I, I, it's the right resolution. If I use a bin width which is too large or too small a number of bins, obviously I'm missing fine scale structure. If I use a bin size which is too narrow, I'm going to have very fine structure, but there may be noise levels in there because there may be underrepresentation within some of the bins that I'm doing. So there's this, this trade off between bin sizes about noise level and missing fine structure <coughs> and you know, that sort of thing. So there's a couple of rules of thumb. If you believe that your underlying distribution is Gaussian in any way, there's this thing called Scott's rule, where they say that the bin width h should be 3.5 times the standard deviation of your data divided by the number of data points you have to the one third. Um, yeah, which is you know you can happily encode that and you can try it on your program. And I think there's one of the examples later. We'll, we'll see that in the notebooks. Um, now, as we said earlier, our data are very often not Gaussian, and there are various statistical tests you can do to see whether you believe they're Gaussian or not in the first place. Um, but if you think you've got non Gaussian, then there's this alternative thing called the Friedman Diakonis rule. Um, so there's a statistical quantity called the interquartile range. Essentially, that's just the difference between, it is just the difference between the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. So it's a very good non-parametric or unbiased estimator of, of the range of your data. Um, and obviously, for a Gaussian distribution, it's the same as the, um, as, as the sigma. Um, but you want to do two times the interquartile range and then divide that again by the, the Q root of the number of density points. And that's sort of, so those are the two sort of two basic rules of thumb um, for, for how to choose bin size and number of bins. Um, they're still a bit ad hoc, though, really. I mean, there must be better ways of estimating this sort of thing. You know, is there any way you can formulate the, the histogram problem as an actual mathematical problem and, and applying you know, something Bayesian? Um, and the answer is yes, there is. Um, what you can do is treat the histogram as what's called a piecewise constant model of the underlying density function. That means you're just trying to fit it by a set of constant blocks. And is there an optimal way that I can do that from the perspective of, you know, setting up the log likelihood function? How many people are, are you all familiar with likelihood functions? Yes, good. That makes life easier. <laughs> um, so there's a thing called the Knuth rule, which sort of says, well, here's your nice uh, log likelihood function of the posterior. And what you want to do is that you want to, uh, you want to optimize this using fixed bin widths. If you have m bins and you have n k measurements in bin k, then there's an optimization problem there. And if you do that, and um, that will then give you the answer of the correct bin width to use. Um, and there's a nice exercise left for you. Or find a piece of code that does it. However, um, you're still using um, fixed bin widths, you're still assuming every bin is the same width, 
that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. I mean, there may be bits of your graph where you actually have, you know, very few points over a large range, and then you have a lot of very fine structure over a small range. So in some cases, or in some sort of um, uh, representation of this, it might make, actually make sense, more sense to use a uh, variable bin width for your histogram. So where you have lots of detail, you can use a very fine grain bin width to maximize the information there. And then if you have <coughs> large chunks where it's all a constant value or a zero value, you could have something zero there. And so um, Jeff Scargill from NASA Ames, who did the long Scargill periodogram, has come up with this idea of what he calls B Bayesian blocks. Um, and there's a, a slightly different fitness function again. Um, but it works for an arbitrary configuration of, of bins. So what that means is that you don't even have to worry about fixed bin widths. You just plug the algorithm in, and it will give you the optimal division of your, um, the optimal histogram representation of your graph in terms of bin widths broad here, bin widths small here, and that sort of thing. Um, um, and fortunately, there is code in both um, scikit-learn and AstroML for doing all of these things, and you'll, you'll play around with that a bit later. But this is really the state of the art. If you want to do histograms, I would recommend doing Bayesian blocks. And the thing is, it doesn't just work for 1D. There is a higher dimension <coughs> representation of this. What you do in higher dimensions is there's a thing called borrowed noise tessellation, which is an optimal way of, of breaking up any high dimensional space into disjoint polyhedra. Um, um, so you <coughs> run a Voronoi tessellation over this, and then that gives you a set of these high dimensional cells, and then you put those through the 1D Bayesian block rule as though you were just optimizing various densities then, and then that will give you what the optimal division of your high dimensional space is in terms of Bayesian blocks. Um, and they don't have to be continuous blocks. So you could have a block here and a block here and a block here, which are all at the same level, all part of the same histogram, but because of the way you've done representation. And this is provably optimal binning in the sense of Bayesian, in the sense that you can attach a, some sort of um, a competence measure to it or something like that. So that, that really would be the state of the art um, for, for figuring out what your probability that is, um, density function is in the data set that you're working with. Okay, so histograms are possibly, as I say, they're the sort of simplest, most basic level. Obviously, they're more the, the sophisticated ways of, of generating the histograms. Um, what about other ways of, of doing um, density estimation? So, uh, next one I uh, talk about is kernel density estimation. I guess most of you may be familiar with this. You've probably done it a bit. You certainly, I think, heard about it in session one back in August. So, this is non parametric. Um, each data point is described by a kernel, which is some well behaved mathematical function, or it has various constraints on it. I think it has to be normalizable. Or um, and then the, the probability density function is estimated as the sum of the kernels. So in this little toy example, we've got our density points here. We plunk, in this case, some sort of, that's probably Gaussian. Um, put a Gaussian kernel centered on each of those. Um, and then, of course, the density function is the, the, the sum of those. Um, so the choices when you're running this, of course, there are different kernels involved. And I think in the notebook from session one, which covers this, they get you to play a bit with the, the different kernels that you can do. Um, you can argue which kernel you want to use. There are, uh, depending what the other, again, what the other assumptions about the data are, whether they're continuous, whether they're discrete, whether, you know, the sort of resolution you want, the, the shape and sorts of things there. Um, so but I'll interject with one quick point, yeah. which is that uh, you know you can make arguments about these things. Some people prefer one thing or another. But there's actually a great way to test it, which we learned about this morning, which is that you can leave some of your data out yes. and use cross-validation. Yeah, 
to figure out both if you're using a good kernel and also if you have a good bandwidth. So I'm going to come on to the bandwidth Sorry. in the next slide. No, but uh, Adam's absolutely right. So cross-validation is a great technique if you want to play around and see what is the best to get to get the right answer out of my data or to get the answer, you know, to actually see um, how uh, how flexible or how robust my data is to different algorithms or, or different ways of, 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 of approaching it. You know, do I believe the one answer from this technique versus this technique, or do I believe the answer with this set of parameters versus this set of parameters? Cross-validation allows you to, to see whether, you know, is there something in my data that's skewing it in, in a particular way against this? And, you know, because, as Adam said this morning, astronomy data is messy, time series data is even messier, and the stuff we're going to get out of LSST is going to be really messy. Um, um, in a statistical sense, not, you know, it's going to be very nice and clean data, but it's, it's going to be poorly sampled, it's going to be noisy, it's irregular, it's gappy, they're going to be missing values, they're going to be all sorts of things that our alg algorithms have to be able to cope with, and that's not necessarily the case. And that, you know, there are going to be lots of data artifacts that we don't understand um, that we may look like interesting results in the first place. And so cross-validation <coughs> and techniques like that allow you to see how, how susceptible your data is or how robust your data is against those sorts of things. So this, as we were saying, so the one choice is kernel. The other choice is what's the ideal bandwidth um, that I want to use. So a bit of math. Um, so, you know, you can formulate the problem in, in a variety of ways. One way that you may be interested in is uh, we can define something called the mean integrated squared error. So we have, this is our estimate of what the PDF is from the sum of kernels, if f h of x. Um, so if we take away the real value, square that up, and of course we're integrating across our thing because we believe that our FFX, is, our underlying PDF is a continuous distribution and we've got a discrete representation here. And then this is the quantity that we want to minimize. And so we can expand the brackets out here and we end up with three terms. Well, this term is not dependent on the, on the, uh, on H at all. H is the bandwidth, so we don't need to worry about that. This integral of the estimated is just what we are estimating by our bandwidth kernel anyhow. So we can calculate that from the data directly. So the, the leftover term is this f of h times the f of x. Um, but that is just the expected value of, you know, this is the f of x. So we've got the integral of something times f of x over dx. That's just going to then be the mean value, or the expected value of our estimate. And we can rewrite that in terms of a <coughs> leave one out cross-validation. So if we have all the data set but we leave one out, and we keep repeating that right across the board, that's going to estimate the mean value of this in, in the same way, you can convince yourself, because it's just a sum over all of those where I'm just leaving one out, okay? Is everyone okay to that point? Yes? Right, good. So then what we can say is, well, I'm going to have to find something called the cross-validation least square score, uh, which is just a made up phrase, I think, in the papers that they write about this, which is then just going to be the difference between this and well, it's, it's essentially this quantity over here. So I'm, I'm dropping my expected value back in here. So it's just this term here, because that's not the thing I, I've said that doesn't matter. So this is the thing that I want to actually calculate. Um, and then it turns out that the optimum value of this is going to be you know, some minimum value, some minimum thing. So what I can do is I can run cross-validation, leave one out cross-validation. So if I've got 10 data points, that means I'm going to run you know, 10, 10 times cross-validation where I'm leaving one out. So I leave every value out. Um, um, I can do that, um, and I can calculate you know, what the value of my cross-validation and least square score is, and at some, some point there should be a value which is the optimal value for me to use um, as, the, um, as the bandwidth for this particular, uh, the particular data set or the particular KDE that I'm interested in doing. 
And again, scikit-learn has, has, has ways of doing that. I think so in the case of, of real data, if you have errors on whatever you're trying to create a KDE for, is the error on that the choice of, should that define your bandwidth and choice of kernel? Uh, could do. I mean, it depends how, in some ways, yeah. You mean you may, you may want to follow that into the kernel. I think there are some kernels which will allow you to do that as an opt as another parameter to go in, to into the kernel. That the bandwidth is a hyperparameter, and and then the 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 error in there is a is a noise flag on there to define an additional smearing out of the thing that you want. Um, yeah, I mean you, you you can see how that may be done, but. Uh, Again, it's this thing that, as, as, as Adam was saying this morning, a lot of times in machine learning, you actually don't put the errors through. Uh, I mean, if you got believe you've got very large errors, then you know that's going to dominate what the kernel size. That may, I mean, you can again, you can do the cross validation exercise to see what the effect is, or you know, take a subsample and see what the effect is on, on, on what you believe is the underlying truth, or you can always simulate it as well. But you know, if you believe if you believe that your error is larger than the uh, the optimal kernel you get, then you know you, you've got problems with your data set of a, of a different kind anyhow. But the, there are maybe more robust ways of estimating the density in that case, um, or you're just going to get you know that's going to limit the the, the 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 range over which the density is valid, and that you can see any degree of structure. In so, I mean, if that was the case, I would be hesitant to believe any claims of substructure below the um, the size of the, the the error that I may believe that I'm seeing in my data. Okay, so we've talked about density estimation um, as a sort of first way of, of, of trying to identify any structure. Um, obviously, the main thing that you always see when you Look at any article or page or, or, or whatever about uh, unsupervised machine learning is clustering. And the basic idea is that you know, a cluster is a collection of objects which are similar in some mm, definition of the word similar and are similar from <laughs> objects that belong to others. Obviously, we have you know, one of these things does not look like the other one. Just can you tell which one it is? Yeah. Multiple words of Sesame Street. Um, there are essentially two broad types of clustering. There's what's called partition clustering. So the idea in partition clustering is, you know, I'm going to break this up into equal groups. In some, you know, they're all on a flat level. There's no implied hierarchy there. And then there's what's called hierarchical clustering, which means I can group these, you know, the group P2 and P3 here together, and then they form a natural subgroup of P4, which then forms a natural subgroup of P1. And that's normally represented through what's called a dendrogram, through this sort of tree diagram. And the idea here is that as I go up the, uh, the vertical axis, I'm um, looking at clustering at a higher level of resolution, or at a, at a broader level of resolution. So the finest grain levels of, of clustering that I would be looking at would be down near the bottom somewhere, up at the top, and right at the top I'm going to see everything just as one cluster. So with hierarchical clustering, I can actually define a particular level of clustering that I might be interested in and sort of cut across there. Or if I was to cut across there, I would have three clusters then. I would have P1, I'd have this sort of subtree of P2 and P3, and then I'd have this tree of P4 over here. Um, so where you may be interested in hierarchical clustering is if you do n-body simulations. And you have you know, dark matter particles which you believe cluster to form galaxies, which cluster to form clusters of galaxies, which cluster to form superclusters, which cluster to form you know, cosmic web or whatever. And so you might apply some sort of hierarchical clustering algorithm to that um, to define spatial structure. Um, hierarchical clustering is typically a, a spatial clustering algorithm, um, or it's used for, you use it to actually in, in documents as well. You can sort of say, you know, these groups of papers are about this subject, which is part of a broader subject, which is part of a broader subject. So if you think of Wikipedia, Wikipedia articles, you know, it could be 
football players who've played with Chelsea and then Chelsea is part of British football teams and then British football teams are part of European teams and you're part of world football teams. So you can see there's a hierarchy there. And so you can do that sort of clustering with that. Partition clustering is more the sort of things that we are typically doing with feature spaces um, where we've got something that you know, we've measured a set of features from and that's the sort of thing. So, um, probably quite familiar with k-means, which is the sort of standard um, algorithm that's used to talk about um, partition clustering. And so we'll, we'll talk a bit about this for, for a little while. Um, I guess you did a bit of this again back in the session one, so some of this will be repeat material. So k-means, um, so you the idea is you divide your objects up into k clusters, where k is a number typically that you specify. Did you have some? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, each cluster is defined by a centroid, um, and each object is associated to its closest centroid. So it's, it's a, a fairly intuitive or, or obvious way of, of doing some sort of clustering. Uh, now the question is, uh, so the algorithm sort of, or one version of the algorithm says how to define the centroids, well, what you do is you choose initial centroids randomly, um, and one of the issues is that the clusters can depend on where the initial centroids lie. Um, so randomly pick a new object associated with its new centroid, so okay, in this case here we've got these, we've got uh, two random centroids here. Uh, we add a new point here. The centroids are then read of finds the mean of the objects in the cluster, so those clusters move the centroid here, and then you reiterate, so we picked a random point here, that moves the centroid here. We pick a random point here, that moves the centroid here, and you keep going, and then you ultimately find, okay, we actually have, we said we've got two clusters, this is what belongs to cluster one, this is what belongs to cluster two. Okay, so it's quite easy to, to carry that. Um, so, most obvious thing is, uh, what's the best way to define the number of clusters that I'm interested in? Um, well, um, if you have domain knowledge, as Anna was saying this morning, if you believe you know how many clusters you're going to have, you know, you can always go with that number. So if, if I'm, you know, if I'm doing variable star uh, classification, and I know that I've got RR Lyrae, Eclipsing Binary, and uh, Cepheids as the main classes, and those are the ones I'm interested in. There may be some, you know, contamination or something else interesting in there. But I believe I've got three classes there, and so I'm going to proceed and see what my data looks like in three classes. <laughs> and then I can then identify potentially outliers in each of those classes after I've done the clustering. But, you know, there I believe I know. But what happens if I don't know? Well, um, so you can go to information theory. Um, there are these different information criteria that you can impose, um, AIC, BIC, or, or DIC, um, depending. They're, they're all basically related to a log likelihood function. So you can sort of define a log likelihood function for k-means, um, and, and then you can use one of these appropriate um, you know, one of them is the log likelihood function plus the number of um, um, free parameters that you have, or some times the number of data points that you have, or the log of the number of data points that you have. But the idea is that you want to minimize the information criteria, so the, the lower the value of the information criteria, the, the better fit you have. So these are sort of non-parametric um, goodness of fit measures, but you can use them as, as ways to um, to select the number of clusters. So I would try two clusters and see what they, the BIC values, and then I'd try five clusters and see if I get a better BIC value, or I'd, I'd try 10 clusters and see what happens. So you, you would go <coughs> through it and see what the BIC value. Um, there are other measures of, um, of how good a fit is, or uh, of, of how good clusters are. Um, one of them is what's called the mean, is one of them is what's called the silhouette, the mean silhouette of the data is the, the thing you're after. So the idea here is that um, the clustering is good if I'm sort of m somehow minimizing the intra-cluster distance and maximizing the inter-cluster distance. So objects that belong to the same cluster are all fairly tight, 
and there are well-defined boundaries between clusters. And um, so the, the silhouette is, is defined in, in this way. It's the, the, the main distance to objects within its cluster, or it's this, this cohesion on how could the intercluster, small intercluster distances, and then um, separation between the clusters. And you want a value that's sort of close to one and positive, positive and close to one as a sort of one. So again, what you can do here is you can cycle through a number of clusters, a number of k values, calculate the mean silhouette for your data, do a plot of k against that, and see if you can see any obvious change or any, you know, what's the value that gives me close to the optimal one. Um, Cross-validation. Um, you can come up with some objective function for x partitions for x clusters and get the mean value of that again. And so you, you know you, you break your data down into let's say tenfold cross validation. I run my algorithm across that and see what the values look like. Um, I mean the whole idea is you know how many clusters do you see here? Are there six clusters? Are there four clusters? Are there two clusters? I can run my algorithm with that and one of these <coughs> to identify which is the data. And then you can also use a similarity matrix. You can calculate what the, the distance matrix is between each of these and the cluster numbers, and then get eigenvalues and eigenvectors for that. And there are algorithms or, or metrics that you can then apply to the similarity matrix to tell you what the optimal number might be. So there's actually a lot of literature on what the best way to find or the, the optimal um, number of clusters for your data set is. Um, and uh, in the notebook, I think we're going to look at the mean silhouette. Um, yes. Um, so what's interesting is, uh, okay, so k-means is, you know, there's, uh, the, 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 this is the very simplest way of, <coughs> of running k-means. Uh, one of the problems we have with LSST is that the data volume is rather large um, and lots of iterations can take a long time if we've got a large number of uh, data points to work with, um, especially if the convergence is not necessarily particularly quick. Um, so that, you know, that could be problematic. So, um, are there things I can do about that? Well, it turns out that algorithmically, yes, you can. Um, so another thing you might see is if you look at um, scikit-learn, you may sometimes see that there are multiple implementations of a particular algorithm or a particular class of algorithm. Um, if you go to other machine learning packages, you will see that you know there are these three different types of doing k-means, which is the best one that I want to use. And the reason for this is because there are different, you know, it may be that my data volume is too large for this, and so I sacrifice um, speed for accuracy in some cases. So you can parallelize k-means. Um, why do you want to do this? Well, you have large amounts of data, so you don't want to send everything to a processor. Um, I want minimum inter-processor communication, and the data set needs to be a read for each interpretation, but each point only can do it by one processor. So if I have a GPU, or if I have a thousand or ten thousand cores, and I have MapReduce or Hadoop or something like that. Um, how many people have heard of Hadoop? How many people have heard of MapReduce? You should read up on MapReduce. It will make your life a lot simpler. Um, the base—I mean, basic—the basic idea is divide and conquer. You have a problem which is embarrassingly parallelizable, and you're just going to break up your data into individual chunks that can be sent to a separate processor. It does some sort of operation, and then there's a result of that, and then you get all of the results from all those sub-things, join them together, and that gives you your answer. So what you know, you can break it if you got. So if it takes you, you know, a thousand hours on one CPU, and you've got ten thousand CPUs you get an answer in six minutes instead of a thousand hours by <coughs> dividing the problem across that is the claim. And it, it's basically scales. So Hadoop is uh, one of the, uh, the data infrastructures which allows you to do this sort of thing. And there, there are other ones out there now as well. Um, but this sort of came out of Google probably about 10 years ago now. Um, 
So the idea with k means is you divide the data amongst processes. So let's say I've got 10 processors, I've got this large data set, I chunk it up into 10. Um, each processor gets the, the cluster sensors from the previous iteration, signs those to the data that it's got in hand, it then calculates new centers based on that, and the new centers are then just the weighted average of the old one from the old processes, and then you just reiterate. And so what you can prove is that you get exactly the same answer with the, this is a, a valid implementation of the Cayman's algorithm, but this is a batch mode implementation of it, so it'll run so many times faster. And if you think that I want to do cross-validation to estimate the number of parameters, the number of clusters I have, or test something, and I've got a very large data set to do that, so I ha I am going to have to run for several of these. Faster versions of the algorithms make these more tractable problems. Okay. Now, what happens if my data is actually too large to store on disk or on available resources or even hold in memory? Um, or the data is not persistent, so I can't process it later, or, or I want rough and ready results just for data exploration. Maybe there's something streaming off the telescope, and I just want to see. Let's say we're looking at SK8 data, which is going to be even larger than LSSD data in volume. And I just want to have a rough and ready idea of what's coming down and, and get some idea how many clusters do I have in this data set with these parameters. Um, so you have streaming al algorithms then. Uh, and the idea here is that um, you're actually only ever going to see the data once. So you don't need to iterate on the data. You just stream the data set through the algorithm once and you get an answer. Okay. Um, so what you would do is you make initial gets, make some initial counts, and you can loop. So you get another data set and what you do is you increment and there's a little there's a weighted formula that you're incrementing your cluster sensors by. Um, but again, you can show that gives you an answer which is exactly the same as the first two, that if I'm either doing the serial or the batch mode. But in this case, I'm not having to iterate over and over the data. I just put the data through once and then I'm fine. So, you know, um, and if you're really smart, you could actually see that you can also parallelize this as well. So I can have parallel streams, so I can just run the whole thing through and then do it at the end. Um, finally, on K means implementations, um, yeah, so K means is prone to local minima. This is one of the problems with K means, that the answer you get at the end may not be the, 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 the best way of dividing up your data. It may be a global min uh, local minima as opposed to a global minima. Your space, and it's also sensitive to where you put the initial clusters. So you would normally rerun the algorithm several times. Now you can formulate algorithms in sort of in what's called a stochastic form, which means that there's an you introduce an element of, of randomness in there uh, to try and get a, a, a better sampling of this high-dimensional parameter space that you're working in. Um, and the claim is that they can reach global minima quicker than you know various things. Uh, terminal convergence can be slowed down, um, but if you want a rough and ready answer, or if your answer is good enough, one of these algorithms can be good. Uh, yeah, great learning algorithm, hopeless optimization. So optimization you know, is, is this terminal convergence problem. The algorithm takes too long to, to, you know, you'll be running over and over again, getting chasing these smaller and smaller returns, but it's, it's really good for finding. So what it turns out is that if you take the math through, and I wouldn't worry about it here, it's actually just the same as the online version in this case. So it's the same as the streaming algorithm, the previous one. So actually the streaming algorithm for k-means is the same as the, the stochastic version. So these are things to be uh, knowledgeable about or aware about that if I'm thinking, oh, my data set is really too large to do cross-validation, using this particular version. But is there another version that I can find out there which is actually, means I only have to go through it once, or I can parallelize it. We all have clusters of machines in our basements uh, we can get access to and run these on, or there are cloud computing. You know, We can go to Amazon, we can ask for a, 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 some allocation to run this stuff on for doing this sort of thing. So you find an algorithm you like, it, gives, it looks good when you've done the first pass rough and ready, and you say, now I want to do it in earnest, but I need to do the cross-validation so that I can make sure that the referee of my paper is going to be happy that I've actually got the right answers. 
be aware that there are these different techniques out there or different ways of implementing the algorithm which can be good for what you're looking for. So that's a lot of stuff from k-means. Um, let me talk about another count, uh, another popular, really popular clustering algorithm called dbscan. Um, the idea behind this is that um, you are defining clusters in terms of number of points within a certain specified radius. Um, and you have, you, you treat your data set as being constructed of three types of points. So I have, um, uh, let's see, what do I have? I have a core point, which is defined as, as something which has at least a certain number of uh, objects within a certain radius. Um, I have something which is a border point, which is, it's not a core point, um, but it's within the neighborhood of, a, of a, a core point. And then I have something which is a na noise point, which is neither. So it, it's outside of the, uh, you know, it has less than min points within a radius, or it's outside of the range of one of these core points. Um, so again, uh, scikit has, has has a version of this, and there's a, an exercise in the notebook to look at this. Um, and uh, again, the question comes, the hyperparameters for this obviously are the number of points, the minimum number of points that I want to use to define what a cluster is, and uh, what my specified radius is. Obviously, the clustering, that, you know, if I say I have a large number of points in a very small radius, I'm going to be identifying the highest peaks within my density. If I say I want a few number of points in a very large radius, I'm, I'm looking at sort of global, large-scale density features or, or, or clusters, um, that sort of thing. So rules of thumb, um, make sure that the minimum number of points is larger than the number of the dimension or the feature dimension of the data set plus one. So if I've got a three-dimensional data set, or I've got, if let's say I've got a seven-dimensional data set, I probably want to have at least eight points. Um, um, and then how can I pick the radius to use? Well, once I've decided what the number of minimal points is, what I want to do is do the nearest neighbor calculation, and uh, you know how to do that now because you saw the algorithm for this morning. Uh, so I want to plot the distance to, I want to do plot the distance to the, uh, in this case, eighth nearest neighbor um, for all my data points. Um, and when I do a plot of the uh, distance against the ordering, um, I should see um, a sharp bend, should look like that. And the, where the sharp bend is, that indicates where it's becoming noise, and that sort of defines the radius where I'm after. So there, there's an example of that in the notebook, and so this will be become more obvious when you when we actually do it. But that's that's the sort of one of the standard definitions, or one of the standard ways that's recommending for picking these two hyperparameters um, for for what I'm after in, the, in defining my algorithm. Of course, what you could also do is you know, you can do your cross-validation again, you can go through the numbers and, and, and see. Uh, minimum points is not so much of an issue. Uh, this one is more of an, uh, the, the, the distance is more of an in issue because that's a continuous value. So it's not as though I can just, you know, I would have to sample and then maybe subsample and subsample. So if there's an easier way of finding it, that's... Now see a mixed model, another way of doing clustering density estimation. I'm not going to talk much about these, um, but they are actually something that's worth looking up or playing around with um, once you, uh, um, if you're interested. Um, so as, as, as Adam showed with his plot this morning, scikit-learn comes with a whole suite of different clustering algorithms. And they all basically have the same format and so what you can do is, um, you know, you try one, try another, you can start playing around with them and see which one works better for your data sets. Um, so Gaussian mixture models assume that all the data points are generated from a mixture of a finite number of Gaussian distributions with unknown parameters. In some ways you can sort of think of this as somewhat similar to kernel density estimation. Um, Non-parametric, you can also think of it as a generalization of k-means, 
which incorporates information about the covariance structure of the data as well. So, so in, in this case, you're not just trying to figure out where the centers of the data are, you're looking for what the, uh, the relationships between the, the different features are, because these Gaussians may be oriented not orthogonally, but in some you know, funny angle, which would be the covariance structure. Um, typically, the hyperparameter or the fine tuning parameter is the number of clusters. Again, so how many clusters do I want to put in it? Um, the algorithm is iterative, and the most common algorithm is expectation maximization, which I think is being covered tomorrow. So you'll learn more about that as, as the technique. But that's the standard way that the algorithm is, is, is written, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, but what you would normally do is you might, you might decide to take, you know, I want five clusters or four clusters, calculate what the, the BIC value or the AIC or the DIC value, one of these um, information criteria values that you can get against the number of clusters, and you look for the min minimum, and that gives you what the optimal version is. Um, Another thing you can do is you can <coughs> attack it from a slightly more Bayesian perspective and you assume that you have a prior which gives you the number of clusters that you're working with. Um, and if you assume it's a Dirichlet process prior, then you can have up to an infinite number of clusters, it doesn't matter, and the math carries it through. So there are implementations uh, where you don't need to worry about specifying a number of clusters, you just are uh, assuming a, a, a Dirichlet prior then, um, and that then will carry you through. But again, that comes with a, a certain number of other assumptions in hand that you need to be aware about if you, you're running that. And scikit-learn has, has versions of both Gaussian mixture models and also what they call a Bayesian Gaussian mixture model, but that's assuming a, a Dirichlet process prior. So you don't need to, so if you want to run it with that, you're making some basic assumption but you, uh, you don't need to actively specify the number of clusters that you're looking at. Let's talk about hierarchical clustering. Okay, um, so the way these algorithms work is that each point, if you remember, each point starts as its own cluster, and then there's some criteria that I'm using to start grouping those up and building up this tree of clusters. So there are actually an, any number of what are called linkage criteria, which specify how one cluster links to another cluster. How do I define what the next cluster as I'm going up is? So single link, this is friends of friends, this is uh, percolation, this is the way you would normally do it if you're building up a, an n-body you know, data cube or identify clusters or whatever. So what I do is I'm looking for the minimum distance between two clusters or between both. So here's a cluster and the point that I next want to connect it to or the cluster I want to connect it to is the one which is the minimum distance. Okay? Complete linkage is the opposite. I want the furthest away point. So I'm looking for here's my cluster. I identify which is the point which has the maximum distance from any point within my clusters, and that's the, the point that I next add or the next cluster that I add up to. Because I would I would actually iterate I might iterate over all of those if I have a number of clusters to identify. Um, average link, well in the average link I'm actually just looking at what the average distance between the two clusters is in terms of all those distances. In centroids I'm actually looking at the distance between centroids uh, of those various clusters. And then there's a criterion called Ward's method um, which is looking at the total distance, and this is somewhat similar again to silhouette, that you're, you're more interested in here is a sum you're playing of the intracluster against the extra, uh, uh, the intracluster against the intercluster distance. Um, and so in this case, you are interested in minimizing or maximizing um, internal versus um, the distance to the other cluster as well. And there's a set of criteria for, for how what you're, you're, you're interested in, in doing there. But so when you're doing a so hierarchy you, cluster. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt for a second. So for friends of friends, then your clusters always have the same number of points, right? Um, so you're starting from a single point and then building up. You build it up and you build it up. Yes. So if you have a data set where you have a small cluster and a large cluster, that's going to give you, that's going to give you possibly nonsensical. Right. Yes. Yes. And then, so I think the same is true of complete link. Yes. I'm less familiar with the step at the bottom. Do you know 
So no, Ward's, you, Ward's you, method is normally the one that sort of reckon. So Ward, the, the, the problem with single link and complete link, another problem with them is that you end up with these very filamentary clusters as you go up the hierarchy. Ward's method gives you clusters which are actually more spherical or more elliptical in shape because it's doing this trade-off between um, the intracluster versus the intercluster. So you tend to get more of a, a, a more realistic separation into, into um, blobs as opposed to... And the blobs can be significantly different sizes? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, I mean, yeah, um, but at some point, it depends on the it, it depends on the porosity um, it depends on the structure of your your, your data space. Um, okay. Yeah. Because if you if you have something which is very sponge like, you can you can end up with these very large clusters and very large clusters over here, and then but these small very dense things which may be far enough away from something that they only get identified as a joint cluster very high up on that hierarchy as you're going up the, the, the hierarchy. Yes. Okay. So with Single link, you're matching each cluster with the cluster that has the data point closest to a data point in it? Yes. So why would you ever use complete link? Because wouldn't that, are you minimizing the maximum distance there? Uh, Is that what that's doing? Like it, it's, it's finding the cluster whose furthest distance is the least? Yes. Okay. So trying to work out why you would get filaments in that case. Uh, you may not get filaments. You certainly get filaments with Yeah, you can see filaments in that uh, You may not, um, and that may be a reason to use complete linking if you don't want filamentary structures so much. Okay. If, you're, if you're interested in sort of broader, better, well-defined clusters. Um, okay. And I think that's actually the default for the agglomerate of clustering algorithm in, um, in scikit-learn. That it does complete link by default because that gives it that avoids the filamentary. Is there computational complexity with Ward's method? Um, yes. 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 <laughs> That's the trade-off. Okay. Trade uh, one of the trade-offs. Uh, so obviously there's linkage. Now there's also uh, similarity metrics. How do you? Well, what are we? So we've been talking about Euclidean distance all the time as being the thing which is the, you know, if two things are very close together in terms of Euclidean distance, that means they must be very similar. But there are other metrics that are used in um, things. There's Manhattan distance if you have very discrete values. Um, it's essentially just the grid distance. You know, it's, it's, you know, if you have values which are one, two, three, four, to say something is 2.5 way doesn't make sense because you have integer values on, on, on a grid, so you may want to use that. Minkowski distance is some sort of generalization of Manhattan and Euclidean. Um, the Halanovis distance takes into account the covariance of the data. So uh, in the case of Gaussian, this will reduce to uh, a weighted Euclidean. Um, and that's actually one, where, one area where you may be able to feed in um, uh, error values. Because you put the code, if you put the, uh, the the measurement errors on the diagonal, then that will give you a, a, a naturally a way to Cosine distance is used more for for textual analysis if you want to see the similarity between two documents, and then jacquard distance is a more general one. Even if you have a list of things and you want to try and identify some sort of measure of how similar things are in in, in lists or sets. Uh, you use the intersection, the module, the module is the intersection against the module split of the unit. So these are again are worth knowing about because there may be the data set that you're working with, or you may have something peculiar about it that you don't want to use Euclidean, you want to use something which replaces it. Um, limits to clustering. Uh, so clustering is obvious what it means when we're dealing with a feature set of maybe up to 100 dimensions for the higher dimensions. Can I cluster spectra, for example? I take a spectrum from Keck, I use a nice high resolution grating, I've got 10,000 data points, I want to calculate clustering of all my other 10,000 data point sets. I have to treat each of them, you know, or it can get even worse. Um, yes, you can. There was a nice paper by, by Tomash Budavari earlier this year on a particular technique. This is the graph taken from that paper. Um, 
These are galaxy spectra from Sloan that they've clustered together according to this technique. And you see there's this very nice branch up here, and it turns out that those are AGM. And actually, there's this evolution along this continuum of the strength of different emission lines that are appearing in the spectrum. So you can do this sort of, you know, okay. Uh, time series, you could do something similar like this, or there's another technique called dynamic time warping, which if I have a very high, you know, what happens if I've got Kepler data with 150,000 data points per time series, for example, and I've got lots of objects and I want to find those that are similar, I can do something like that. What about images? How do I cluster images? How do I find images that are similar to each other? Convolutional neural networks, do, there'll be more talk about that later on in the week with the, with the deep learning stuff. Um, what about documents? How do I find two papers that are similar to each other? I talked a, bit, a little bit about that this morning with the, the, the spam, but there's a technique called latent Dirichlet allocation, which is, again, a way of representing and doing clustering. So there are different techniques out there depending on what your data set is. It, it, it doesn't just need to be a, you know, I've got a, a 10 feature Sloan data set. What happens if I've got this data set? One thing to be aware of is very high dimensions are sparse. Um, clusters occupy increasingly small volumes in very high dimensions. So a lot of the time you may actually be, if you can reduce your data down, so if I've got a you know 10,000 dimensional space, it'd be much easier maybe if I could work with a 10 dimensional representation of that in some way. Because there's all this vast space that I'm going to waste computational time in some way going through that. And so that brings me on to just a couple of last slides on dimensional reduction techniques. Um, Self-organizing maps, something you may be interested in. These are unsupervised learning, it's a type of artificial neural network trained to produce. So you can put a high dimensional data set in and, and what you do is you create a, a 2D or a 3D map, a low dimensional representation of, the, uh, of your input space. And the idea here that is, is that it's, it maintains topological information, which means that if you have clustering in the high dimensional space, your input space, it's also maintained in your low dimensional representation. So this is an example of a 10,000 dimensional data set of galaxies, NGC galaxies, based on how they're described in NED, uh, with all the different possible tags on them. So each galaxy is represented by a 10,000 dimensional text vector. Um, depending whether a term appears or not, um, and I collapse it down, and then you can see well, there are sort of this is the, the self organizing mass in this case. You can see some obvious clusterings. When you look at uh, galaxy types as well, then there's galaxy types, yeah, uh, SB, SA, B, SBA, you can see different colorings. So, um, what that means is that. In terms, you know, some of the NGCs are of this type of galaxy, some of this are of this type of galaxy, and you can do this sort of thing. Um, there's a paper by Matthias Kresko Kind and, and Rob Brunner from 2014 where they actually apply self organizing maps as a way to estimate photometric redshifts. So there's an unsupervised learning technique applied to, to that problem there. So they're an interesting problem. We can talk more about those offline if you're interested in. A more sophisticated, more state-of-the-art one is what's called T-distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding. Um, this is slightly more recent, but it's the same idea. High dimensional space, I have a low dimensional representation. The low dimensional representation is topologically preserving, so clustering in the high dimensions is the same as the low dimensions. Um, what it's doing is information constraints and probability distributed between the two. So this is uh, 20,000 quasar time series, um, which have been characterized by a particular statistical technique, which gives me, I think, 10 parameters. So this is a, t a representation of the 10 dimensional space. Um, you can see obvious clusters. Um, human eye is really good at this. Then if I color code it according to redshift, <coughs> So obviously there is structure in there that all the high redshift objects are over here, all the lower redshift objects are over there. So it's preserving this sort of information. So again, you know, this is a good technique for maybe identifying. I, and what I could do then is I could run k-means over this, or a, a regular two-dimensional thing. Um, and a cluster here is then, because these are topologically preserving, guaranteed to be a cluster in this higher dimensional space. 
and I don't need to worry about running this thing in a 10 dimensional or a 100,000 dimensional thing, I can run it just as equally validly on a two dimensional. And I'll finish. Matthew? Yes, Daniela. It's maybe worth noting though with TSNI that TSNI doesn't generalize. Like uh, you can't train. Yeah, you, can't you can. You can. There is a pat there is a parametric version of TSNI. All right, but at least the one for the one that's currently implemented in scikit learn. Yes. So the, the, so Daniela is absolutely right. The the problem with this is is the stochastic nature of it. So if you run it in uh, uh, repeat implementations of the algorithm within TSME will not give you repeatable results. That's somewhat true of the self-organizing map as well. Um, but there are versions of the algorithm that you can run which are uh, where you can run it as a classifier in the sense that you can put a training set through it, identify classes, and then you could use that uh, again. But you're right, the default version in, in um, in scikit-learn is is not uh, parametric. You cannot run it in that sort of mode. You can't use it as a as a as a train. But you can you can at least run it to give you some feel for how many clusters you may as a visualization technique. Do I believe there is structure in my data set? Can I uh, uh, do colors? Finally, symbolic regression, unsupervised learning. Um, I want a function that describes my data set. Um, so we're all familiar with linear regression where we know what the functional form is, it's on a straight line. With symbolic regression, this is a genetic algorithm. Um, what I do is I define a set of building blocks that I'm going to be using in terms of algebraic operators or mathematical functions, sine power law, exponential log, or whatever. Um, and then that defines, uh, defines a particular space that I can build up a genetic algorithm that's going to run over it take various bits and pieces and then tries to see how good that fits my data. So I have, you know, I'll, it'll generate an arbitrary algebraic expression. It evaluates it on the data. If it's a good one, then that's used as the seed for the next generation in this genetic algorithm. How many people are familiar with genetic algorithms? Okay. So it's just like evolution. You start off with some function uh, you test it against your data. If the function is good, it's the parent for the next generation. If it's bad, you throw it away and you do some sort of clever DNA type thing where you cross populate between genes of your fit fitness functions and then work through. Um, what this does is it produces at the end a set of candidate expressions. Um, so you get multiple results out of this technique. You get shorter expressions which are simpler but less accurate and you get longer expressions which are better fitting, more accurate but they may be fitting into the noise. If you want an example of this, uh, there's a paper by Kremers and whatever for photometric redshift again. They fit using colors <coughs> and redshift um, and a particular algorithm. They ran this on I think 50,000 Sloan galaxies I got this fitting function, and then this is their data. So this is the zip, this is the error. This is out to redshift one, one redshift ones over here. So you can see oh, it's not bad, and it's an analytic function. So I can see what the dominant terms are in terms of photometric redshift, and so I can get some in insight into what's maybe useful in terms of features and this sort of thing. And that's called feature extraction, um, and that's a whole talk again. So um, endpoint of course unsupervised learning um, <laughs> becomes too smart and takes us all over. But um, I hope that's given you a feel for what there is in unsupervised machine learning. It's clustering, it's dimension reduction. There are other techniques. The whole idea is that you're trying to identify the structure in the data that you believe you know um, and, and let the data do it as much of itself as possible. Um, without us trying to impose what we believe the data should look like. Uh, because we don't know. There may be some weird thing in some high dimension that we have no idea about. And if we make assumptions about the data is like, we may be missing that entirely or may be misinterpreting. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Let's thank Matthew. <laughs> now, before we do the break, I'll ask if there are any questions or Matthew can take your question. Yes, any questions? I'm here most of the week. 
YouTube, suddenly you think of something or see something, you just grab me and you know, if you want to know more about symbolic regression or TSE or anything like that. Uh, all right, so no further questions. Um, we will now uh, go to break. Um, we, we're just a little bit behind, so it's... A